and the panelists. Uh, we have uh, four distinguished panelists today, um, and we're going to try to get started as soon as possible. Um, we're going to begin. Uh, two of our panelists are a bit late. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Ben Becker, who is uh, at the uh, Graduate Center. Uh, he's an academic uh, scholar, uh, and uh, he is uh, with the Party of Socialism and Liberation. Uh, but before I start just for a moment, I just want to say that uh, one thing that we are uh, trying to uh, accomplish here is to have a very uh, thoroughgoing conversation. So I hope that people have uh, questions thereafter. Um, and the other thing is if people are interested in these kinds of events, you're welcome uh, to uh, sign up on the sheet because there's a lot of events uh, in New York City and so forth that uh, a number of the organizers of this group, including especially the Journal of Labor and Society, would like to organize, uh, to invite you to. The Journal of Labor and Society is a Marxist uh, uh, global uh, labor and political economy journal. Okay, uh, so we'll start with Ben, and uh, if you'd like to sit or stand, it's up to you. Uh, um, better. Sure. If I can stand. Do you have a chair for you? Uh, yeah, we'll have a chair for you. <coughs> all right, good afternoon, everyone. You're all doing all right? Um, so when I saw the panel, I saw there were people who probably know more about uh, economics than I do and would be able to go into some of the, in greater depth, into the economic elements and the economic arguments of capital. So I wanted to just speak a little bit to what I consider it's a uh, continuing political and historical relevance and what it can, what it actually says about Marx himself and Marx's uh, ability to not just be a theoretician but as a revolutionary, uh, his practice as well. Uh, you know, if you think about the period in which Capital was written and why he wrote it, I think that speaks uh, very directly to some of our tasks of the present. Uh, you know, if you looking at Marx's economic works, you see an evolving sort of argument, decade after decade, of revision, going back to it, and of constant interruption. Constant interruption. He's always, uh, when he's writing uh, Wage, Price, and Profit, he's interrupted in the 1840s. He says, this argument will be continued in the next article of my newspaper, and that article never comes out because there's uprisings in Ireland and all across Europe that he has to respond to. And, uh, and of course, he doesn't really turn back to uh, economics. That was in the early 1840s until the 1850s as a central aspect of it. And why does he return uh, to economics in the 1850s? Is because he's just gone through the defeat of the 1848 and 1849 revolutions. And he's trying to understand why. And he's trying to understand how is it that we could have been so optimistic and confident that the working class and the oppressed were going to overthrow this system. And instead of succeeding, all the revolutions have been broken up. A period of reaction has set in. A period of counter-revolution has set in uh, in the 1850s. And he wants to understand what was the economic laws of motion. How is it that capital was able to survive? What is the relationship between the economic system and the political movements to change that uh, economic system. Uh, so uh, he again turns back to economics, and then again, of course, he's interrupted in the 1860s. And the, uh, when, when Capital comes out in 1865, he's also just uh, helped in the founding of the First International. And in the 1860s, he's returning to uh, he's returning to worker organizing, especially in London. And Capital, Volume 2 and Volume 3, never come out under uh, while he's alive. They come out because Engels has ushered them into publication. So if you think about him as uh, his economic writings always being interrupted, I think that speaks a lot to what Marx is called praxis, right? The theory and practice. He was really the epitome of that. Uh, he was a... Um, it also makes me feel better that my dissertation is incomplete after all these years that I can always say, I'm being interrupted by political events, just like uh, Karl Marx was. Um, but 
as he, you know, as he left Germany and he, he, he was coming to the conclusion that the setback of 1848 and 1849 was not just a little temporary or momentary setback, that there was something deeper going on in the, the logic of how capital was uh, expanding and that made the system more durable and made the working class insufficiently organized at that moment to overthrow capitalism. So that's the reason why he went into the London Library, got his little reading ticket, and spent so many years there, was that he was trying to understand uh, the, the defeat of the movement that he had given so much time to. He wanted to verify and validate that even though they had been defeated temporarily, that, that the cause to which he uh, had devoted so much was not a lost cause, that in fact he and Engels and the other communists were right. That was the, the reason for the economic study. So I think that um, that's very important for, for our uh, understanding of these historical works like Capital, is that we're not seeing them as sort of abstract dogma, dogma or religious documents that were sort of just true because great smart people wrote them, but these are theoreticians and organizers, full-time revolutionaries, uh, who, were, who were fighting and then studying their fight, and then fighting again based on a higher development of theory, uh, and then studying again, and, and that capital is part of that process. And there's no uh, greater proof to Karl Marx as a full-time revolutionary than if you look in his um, letters, especially to his friends and associates, he's always, always asking for money, uh, which shows that that's all he really cared. He wanted to find a way to always be writing and always be organizing, uh, that he wasn't uh, seeing either of those things as, as separate. Um, in just a few years um, after he's published Capital, which is this treatise, his lifelong work sort of all uh, uh, combined into one. Uh, he's, you know, writing letters to the communards of Paris about how to pass secret information uh, from uh, to to over to to get past the state. He's talking with spies within Bismarck's government uh, about the plans that Bismarck is making. In other words, this is a person who is pr uh, profoundly interested in in the actual practice of making revolution. So. Um, you know, in the PSL, we've been uh, examining this period of history that we're currently in in somewhat similar terms to the period in which Marx uh, turned to capital, in the sense that the overthrow of the Soviet Union really uh, represents the beginning of a new period of reaction and counter-revolution. You could say that period perhaps began with the opening of China uh, to uh, capitalism in 1978, and then up to the overthrow of the Soviet Union, that period uh, led to a profound despair and demoralization within the communist movement internationally, not dissimilar to how the defeat of the 1848 revolutions led to such despair among those who had been at the barricades in that year. And uh, Karl Marx was returning to capital in order to show that uh, the, the, the system, even though it had temporarily held on uh, in the 1850s, still had these built-in contradictions. It still had, uh, it was still a crisis-prone system. In fact, the agony and the misery that the workers were experiencing, he explained, was an inverse relationship to the, cap to the capital that was accumulating, that these were not accidental. He was trying to explore uh, what provoked capitalist crises, he was trying to uh, restore that socialism uh, had a scientific basis, and really, capital was the uh, capital was the the most thorough destruction of utopian socialism. In fact, because it showed not that the utopian socialists were wrong because they wanted a better egalitarian society, they were wrong because they believed that by appealing to the conscience of their oppressor, that somehow they could achieve that world. So. Similar to our current moment, I think, or at least the last 20 years, there's been a, a, a necessity to go back and study, even if capital is temporarily on the offensive, as it was in the 1990s, 
it still has these built-in uh, contradictions and crises to which it will always return. It can only offer agony and misery to the vast majority of the world's people. And um, similar to how Marx had to go through a period of understanding the defeats, understanding the problems of socialism, but not in a, not in a perspective of cynicism or despair, but to really learn from it so that when the socialist movement was reborn, as he understood it would be, it would be reborn on a higher theoretical level than on the one in which it was defeated. And so I think that uh, this period is somewhat similar where we have socialism now returning and similar to the first international period of 1864 where Marx realized, even though he already theoretically opposed <coughs> anarchism and utopian socialists, he realized that there had to be a broad alliance of those who were rejecting the ravages of capitalism and he said, we will fight it out within our first international about the supremacy of scientific socialism compared to these other currents. Now, uh, in this period, uh, the revolutionary Marxism also has to be revived through that same spirit of both openness to united fronts and also openness to polemic and, and debate. You could say from the period of when capital was written, perhaps up into the overthrow of the Soviet Union, it was inevitable that any workers' movement or liberation movement that was progressive would almost automatically turn to the precepts of scientific socialism because there was historical continuity from the first international, the second international, the third international, all those other internationals. Uh, there, was, there, was, um, there was continuity in the sense that if you wanted to change the world, it was understood you were going to turn towards... Uh, Marxist concept. There were Marxist bookstores everywhere. There were mass Marxist parties in so many countries, practically every country. Capital was a bestseller, not just among theoreticians and intellectuals, but among workers who started to come into economic, uh, uh, started to organize. They wanted to study capital. But the defeat of the Soviet Union um, led to a rejection of a lot of scientific socialism, as we know. And uh, in, in a, in, in a profound sense, ruptured that historical continuity. And so now, just like Marx and Engels understood well, as they were writing Capital that you sort of have to, socialism as a movement sort of has to start over. I think that we're in a, a similar movement w moment where we're sort of starting over. Of course, we're learning all the lessons of the Second International and the organizational lessons, I think, especially of the Third International. Of course, we have a higher and enriched understanding of imperialism than Karl Marx could have when he wrote Capital, but I think the historical moment is similar insofar as we are trying to uh, revive socialism out of a period of reaction and counter-revolution. Uh, we are again having to contend with the ideological currents that have grown up in the defeat of, uh, of socialism, namely postmodernism, anarchism, lifestyleism, um, and, um, and social democracy. But um, in that sense, I think that uh, uh, Marx uh, gave so many years to, um, to the study of economics so that when the movement picked up, it would, uh, just to reaffirm this, it would start at a higher theoretical level. And I think that so much of capital is still relevant today. I'm sure the other speakers will speak to, to uh, that in more detail. But from the uh, growing... Uh, uh, Polarization, of course, between rich and poor, the, the, the theory that the capitalist system was prone to crises, and um, uh, his, his, obviously all his discoveries about surplus value. If you go through so many things for many workers today who are dealing with instability, precariousness, uh, uh, poverty, oppression, depression, suppression, repression, all of that is inside of capital as well as he's talking about capital as a uh, organic, uh, as, a, as a social organism, not just talking about it as a, a set of economic theories, but the way in which uh, capital came about as a system. Um, to, to paraphrase Eric Hobsbawm when he spoke about the Communist Manifesto on its 150th anniversary, in a, in a lot of ways capital is more relevant today than in the time in which it was uh, written. So I think there's a lot there for us to return to. And I think uh, politically, uh, especially, there's a lot we can still learn from Marx during this period, which is to approach theory and to approach uh, our intellectual exercises from the standpoint of 
praxis of how we can help the movement uh, uh, start on a higher uh, theoretical level, on a more scientific understanding of that beast that we are fighting. That's always why Marx wrote, that's always why he studied. He wanted to know thy enemy. And, uh, and I think that Capital is still the uh, central textbook for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Hopefully we'll have a, a discussion following this. Um, uh, one point I wanted to say is that, uh, just to reiterate, that uh, there will be a, a sheet going around for people interested in the events that are organized by uh, Journal of Labor and Society. And uh, some of the speakers here will also be participating in the uh, days and uh, months to come. Uh, and there are many other venues that uh, we will also be distributed to, including uh, the commons and so forth. Uh, the next speaker um, is uh, Juliette Uccelli. Um, she is a uh, longtime expert in capital. Um, she's a member or founding member of the Breck Forum originally, I believe, as I recall, uh, which I also sat on the board with, so I'm very humbled that you were able to come. And uh, she's also an expert in capital. And so I would like to uh, give the floor to Juliet Uticelli. The next uh, speaker, um, every speaker will have about 12 minutes or so. So uh, if you'd like, you can stand or sit down. Can you tell me when it's six minutes? It's right. supposed to be 12 minutes, right? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I know it's hot in here. We can't do anything about that, huh? OK. Can you stand slightly to your left? There you go. Okay. Yeah, we worked on the school system. We never like it when the classroom's not. Yeah, I know. It's, it's not too loud. It's good for the lessons. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many people in here have studied capital? Well, how many people have taught it? Great. OK. Um, I, I had a feeling that might be the case. So I'm approaching this from the angle of someone who's been teaching capital to activists um, at the Breck Forum, as Manny said, but more recently at the Marxist Education Project in Brooklyn. So um, I've, I've studied all three volumes, but I really know most about volume one, and that's the one I teach. Um, I'm not an economist, but a social worker and psychotherapist, so I didn't learn, uh, I didn't study this capital at the university, but I was lucky enough that at the New York Marxist School, we had some of the paramount Marxist theorists of the last 40 years Harry Magdorf, Anwar Sheikh, Bertel Oman, Robert Fitch, Robert Langston, um, they all came and taught us, paid nothing, because they wanted to teach activists. So that's how I learned. I learned from the best. Um, so today, young activists still find capital relevant, I find, because some of them still come to study it. So why is that, right? Um, well, the first reason is that it, it gives a grasp of what makes capitalism tick, its laws of motion, as Marx said, um, and it answers a lot of questions, like why does there have to be unemployment in capitalism? Well, because capitalism needs this industrial reserve army, because if it didn't have one, then when there was a high demand for labor, the price of labor could get too high, and that could hinder accumulation. With the reserve army, you just bring some people from that into the labor force, into the active labor force. That's what capital wants, what they need. Um, why is technology changing all the time? Why are capitalists who um, always want to make more money trying to make products cheaper? Well, because they want to be able to sell them cheaper, capture more market share, and temporarily get a surplus profit, which can be prolonged by monopolies, uh, et cetera, but, and patents, but not forever. This is Marx's concept of relative surplus value. I'm just pulling out some things that you might know, but kind of putting it all together. Um, uh, why are there uh, recessions and, and depressions? Uh, you know, we talked about overproduction. And then it addresses a question that we often don't think to ask because we take the current order for granted, which is how in this incredibly complicated economy, which has no overall intentional regulation of production, does labor get allocated to meet products that meet, to make products that meet people's needs and desires? Now, it doesn't work well, but how does it work at all? Um, and this is what's explained by the central con uh, concept of the, law and val of the law of value, which the market and the pricing mechanism serves to allocate labor to make goods. And then maybe there's too many made, so prices get slashed, and workers get laid off, and firms get bankrupt, and new businesses come into being, and then things are reallocated for the next year with new efforts. That's how capitalism works, by not working. Right? Um, and uh, within this law of value, he also explains this cool stuff like the, law, the role of supply and demand, how actually some things that have no labor in them can still have a price, 
how rent fits in um, and why rents are an increasing portion of the loot of the ruling class today. Um, and um, so, so that's, and, and also um, some sections are really pressing in, in pointing out uh, problems and potential solutions um, and program that, that have only come to broad awareness in the last 50 years. And I'm thinking particularly of what amounts to a real ecological call to arms um, in the last um, section of chapter 15, uh, which is called Modern Industry and Agriculture. And I'm just quoting a little because it's really uh, cool. Um, Capitalism prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence, it hinders the operation of the eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. By destroying the circumstances surrounding that metabolism, which originated in a merely natural and spontaneous fashion, it compels the systematic restoration of this metabolism as a regulative law of social production and in a form adequate to the full development of the human race. Note that for Marx, um, so saving the earth is always intertwined with giving human beings fulfilled lives. Um, and, and of course, this is the basis from which uh, John Bellamy Foster draws out and elaborates the concept of ecological rift as the basis for Marxist ecological praxis. Um, so um, a second reason, I know that was only one really, is that how it explains all these cool things. Uh, the second reason why um, people find capital still relevant has to do with the breadth of the spheres of life and struggle that it illuminates. In no way can capital be contained within the boundaries of the bourgeois disciplines of political economy or anything else. For example, volume one contains a political history of the struggle to limit the workday to 10 hours, how the workers' movement took advantage of a conflict of interest between the parasitic classes, the landlords and the capitalists, to win legislation in parliament. It's, it's a very nuanced and pragmatic approach that appreciates the role of honest, petty bourgeois reformers like the factory inspectors that illuminates the questions of tactical and strategic alliances. And there's a great quote at the end of that uh, chapter, which I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase, where Marx says, the workers had to, come, had to put their heads together as a class to erect a law, an all-powerful social barrier that would prevent the individual members of that class from voluntarily selling themselves to capital too cheaply. So it's, it really has in this one sentence all the contradictions that we face and deal with in pressuring the bourgeois state apparatus to, um, to enshrine certain kinds of gains for workers and to regulate. Um, it also provides um, the, the basis of a psychological theory of alienation, isolation, and dissociation through the concept of commodity fetishism, which I, I won't go into right here. Um, it's an amazing compendium of data on occupational safety and health, on the development and manipulation of stratifications within the working class, especially by gender, um, nationality, and race, and on the development of technology. Um, a third reason why it remains relevant is that some of the sections are so beautifully written. I mean, they're really great literature. The dramatic imagery around blood-sucking vampires and the poetic language about how the production process distorts and cripples the worker. Um, it's been noted, um, it, it's why in my way I consider it um, a profoundly spiritual work in a certain sense, actually. Um, it's been noted how well the translators for the first English edition, Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, rendered Marx's words into English without losing the poetry. More recently, it's come to light that the major credit for the translation should actually go to the person who, second only to Engels, was Marx's closest collaborator and confidant in the second half of his life, and that was his daughter, Eleanor. Eleanor's husband um, was Edward Aveling, her common-law husband, who was a real scumbag, but she loved him, and uh, he was a, you know, it happens, right? Um, he, was, he was a wannabe playwright and essayist, so she wanted to give him some credit, but actually a lot of the beauty of the translation is due to Eleanor Marx. Um, so th the last thing I would say about um, capital remaining relevant is that in order for that to happen, um, we who teach it have to 
help make it accessible to others. Um, lately, I've been teaching mostly uh, highlights of Capital Volume 1 in 10 sessions. Now, the reason for this is that um, young activists um, are dealing with uh, having to work several jobs to make a living in New York City, which Marx would call the de facto lengthening of the working day, which we fought to limit. It's lengthened by having to have multiple jobs. And also, they're dealing with rising urban rents. This makes it really hard to live in this city, so that I have young activists who come and, um, you know, all colors and backgrounds and nationalities, and, and I'll say, listen, listen, do you really have 10 weeks? Because tell me what time you have, and I'll give you the essence of what we can do in that amount of time. And say, no, no, I'm in, I want the 10 weeks. But then they drop out, because they can't help it. They got a new job, their hours get changed. They don't have the privilege of studying that uh, my generation did, um, mostly because rents were so much lower, the rents that we had to pay. Um, I also get a number of graduate students who say that they read capital in graduate school, but they didn't understand it, and they didn't think the teacher understand it, understood it either. So now they're coming because they do actually want to understand it. Um, so my mentor, Arthur Felberbaum, who was the primary initiator of the Marxist School and Brecht Forum, and who originated the pedagogy for Capital Volume 1 that, that I still follow, um, he used to say that the teacher's main role is to be a cultural bridge to the book, because the dialectical method is so alien to our Anglo-American ways of thinking. Um, capital embodies the dialectical method, and it's the best um, source for learning it, but only if the teacher is consciously using the prefaces and other parts of it where Marx talks about his methodology um, to bring it out for the students, and also to talk about, at the beginning, how Marx saw the structure of capital, so you kind of know where you're at and where you're going to go, because it can be overwhelming. Um, so, um, so one thing I like to always talk about is what Marx calls the method of inquiry and the method of presentation, which are different. Um, the method of inquiry starts with what Marx called in the, the notebooks for capital, known as the Grundrisse. He called this the imaginary concrete. This is the phenomena we see around us. What happens in the market, what we read in newspapers, what we read in novels, what people are thinking and saying, um, the shifts of the market. But it's concrete in that sense, but it's imaginary, because if you stay on that level, you don't actually understand anything if you stay on that surface level only. So the next thing he does, and I, I like to quote what he said, um, he says, um, uh, uh, this would be a chaotic conception of the whole. Um, so then I move by further determination analytically towards ever more simple concepts from the imagined concrete to ever thinner abstractions until I had arrived at the simplest determinations. Now this is where the method of presentation starts in Capital Volume 1. He has arrived at the most basic determination, the historical logical self form of capitalism, the commodity. From that, uh, from there, he says, the journey will have to be retraced until I have finally arrived at the concept again, but this time not as the chaotic conception of a whole, but as a rich totality of many determinations and relations. People ask, like, why did Marx start with the commodity? Why didn't he start with capital? Why didn't he start with labor? Well, labor is too general. You, labor exists in all human societies 10,000 years before capitalism. That's going back a little too far. Why didn't you start with capital? Because you can't explain capital unless you've already explained the commodity and money. So the commodity <coughs> is the place to start because commodities existed in a small way before capitalism, but they only become generalized and universal within capitalism. So within the, con within the, uh, the, the commodity and the contradiction between value, between use value and value, that's the embryonic form of all the contradictions that will come to fruition under capitalism. Okay, perfect, okay. Um, so um, so there's, there's no proof of the theory in chapter one. It's like the whole three volumes is the proof of the theory. But by the end of chapter one, you can get a sense that this hangs together and makes sense and I want to know more. Um, so other things to keep in mind, um, Definitely really delve into the contradiction between use value and value in chapter one. It's the heart of everything. But don't spend forever on chapter one because, it, uh, again, people can get stuck in it. The minutiae can be frustrating. 
charts, graphs, visuals, and narratives of key concepts help, and I use all of those. And enjoy the historical and the poetic parts, which are really so cool and moving. Thank you. I'm going to talk from here. Uh, for those who... Michael Hudson from University of, uh, of Missouri, Kansas City, author of J for Junk Economics. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I began teaching Marxism at the graduate faculty of the New School in uh, 1979, 1969, uh, and I'm currently a professor at the School of Marxist Studies at Peking University. Uh, I had The problem I had at the New School, and the problem that I have with talking to Marxist groups, including this, I can see from the uh, lectures, is most of you, when you think of capital, you think of volume one. and there are actually three volumes of capital, uh, and volume one is focused on because that's where Marx uh, analyzed the dynamics and the laws of motion of industrial capitalism. But volume two and three are about what preceded industrial capitalism and what Marx hoped that the task of industrial capitalism would be to free society from. They're on rent and on banking and interest and finance. Uh, especially in volume three uh, for finance. In uh, 1970, I was uh, uh, taught, a, uh, one of the courses I taught at the New School was on national income accounting. And I used uh, what uh, was actually the at that time the Bible uh, for accountants, Marx's theories of surplus value. Uh, where uh, Marx, uh, it was Marx who developed the concept of depreciation of capital. In his critique of the physiocrats in Tenet, uh, the circular flow that you had within the French economy between landlords, the government, and consumption, he didn't have any statistic for keep restoring the seed grain from year to year, the seed grain that you needed in order to plant the next crop. Marx used this as an example of capital. He, he divided the return of capital into two parts. The return to capital, which is profits from employing wage labor, but also the return of capital in depreciation. This is made very clear in uh, uh, volume one of uh, Marx's three volume theories of surplus value. He intended that book to be the original volume one of capital. Uh, when it was translated in the 1950s, 1952, uh, it was called the legendary volume four of Capital. Uh, there was a great fight over it. Uh, it was published by, uh, the, I think, the leading Marxist in America, Terence McCarthy, who was also uh, the chief economist for General Electric. Uh, the Stalinists broke into the printing company, poured acid over the plates for volume two and three uh, of Theories of Surplus Value to prevent it being translated into English long enough for the Stalinist thug Dobb in London to uh, come with a completely convoluted translation on confusion between price and value that Marx makes absolutely clear in his theories of surplus value. Uh, in that book, Marx described how his ideas emerged naturally from the classical economics of the physiocrats, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and what uh, made people so upset about Marx that he said that capitalism itself was revolutionary. And it was revolutionary in clearing away the landlord class, even in Ricardo you have that, clearing away the banking class as it stood, and restructuring banking uh, so that instead of being predatory and based on uh, usury and uh, uh, ripoff, uh, and it would actually fund uh, industry. Uh, he believed that, uh, especially in volume three of Capital, uh, and also in volume three of Surplus Value, he wrote the Capital and Surplus Value together. And I can guarantee you, you will uh, understand uh, Capital much better if you read it in conjunction with his theories of Surplus Value. Uh, he looked at the uh, industrial capitalism's banking in the future as being German banking. Uh, and German banks were very different from English and American banks. Uh, they, uh, the banks would actually act as, uh, with the government, uh, the German government, uh, and with industry, especially heavy industry, to make a long-term plan 
uh, of uh, development of capital. And the banks, unlike the English and American banks, would take a stock ownership as well as the uh, uh, is a uh, just a debt uh, uh, complaint, a debt uh, ripoff. By the time World War II, uh, World War One broke out in 1914, uh, the British uh, main British magazine, the Economic Journal, uh, wrote a series of articles uh, worrying that uh, England and the Allies were going to lose the war because they were so uh, far behind uh, British banking. There was a, a book, a, a book uh, published uh, in Germany uh, called uh, Middle Europa, saying that uh, Middle Europe, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Central Europe, <coughs> was emerging as the center of industrial capitalism and where uh, British stockbrokers would simply put uh, investors into the stocks and look for a quick ripoff and then get out and uh, British stock investors and banks would push for a very fast dividend payout, uh, the German banks would say, don't pay out the dividends, uh, reinvest it in capital. We have to increase uh, employment to build up a uh, German uh, labor force. Uh, and by the time World War I broke out, in every country, this seemed to be the uh, future of capitalism. The future of capitalism was expected to be led by the most advanced uh, in, uh, Western nations. Germany, maybe Austria, uh, possibly England uh, la uh, lagging on. But uh, we all know what happened. Uh, America went into the wrong side of the war. Uh, on England's side, Germany lost. And uh, the world has followed uh, the Anglo-American uh, financial system and the Anglo-American economic system. But even more than that, uh, you had, uh, after World War I, a fighting back by the real estate interests, by the banking <coughs> interests, by the rentier interests, the very classes that Marx thought that industrial capitalism was going to get rid of. So uh, in volume one of Capital, he talks about the faux fray of production, the false costs of production, the needless costs of production that are simply paid to the rent extractors, to the landlords, uh, to the banks. He said, under a, uh, uh, the, uh, the reason that a uh, socialist economy is going to uh, emerge victorious is it's more efficient, it's more productive, and uh, the productive forces of the industrial capitalist nations are still uh, burdened down by the legacy of feudalism, by the landlord class uh, and uh, by, the, uh, by the banking class that has turned predatory. Uh, to such a point that today you have uh, the American uh, banks and stock uh, uh, brokers. The actual management of industrial firms in America has been financialized to the point that 92% of corporate earnings are spent either on stock buybacks solely to increase the price of stock or on higher dividend payouts. Uh, well, uh, when I used, uh, uh, I was only able to use volume one of uh, theories of surplus value in 1970 because that, uh, they uh, had not translated the rest yet. Uh, later, Moscow came out with a very good translation of uh, volumes two and three of theories of surplus value. Uh, but at that time, uh, the department head, Bob Haubrunner, a Stalinist, uh, was uh, furious with me. Uh, he said, this course is, you know, you're a Wall Street thug. It's true, I was Chase Manhattan's balance of payments economist and uh, uh, balance of payments analyst for Arthur Anderson. Uh, we never discussed politics there. Uh, I grew up knowing, I think, uh, just about every uh, socialist leader in the United States, uh, members of the Third International from Lenin was in power. And uh, when we were talking about reading capital, when I was like nine or ten years old, we'd go to their houses. I'd always look at uh, the bookcase, and my eyes would always be drawn to the books that I recognized. The Charles Kerr edition, the red edition of the three volumes of Capital. Uh, I, I noticed pretty quickly that nobody had ever opened these volumes. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, uh, especially volumes two and three. You could tell from the spine. Nobody read them. Everybody, it's true that uh, they were bestsellers. It's true that workers and other people bought uh, Capital. Did they read it? Uh, that uh, I, I began to suspect they didn't, and uh, 
in the 1960s, when I used to stop at Strand Bookstore and other stores, and they'd always have a section with uh, Marx's uh, Capital and others, I'd usually take a look through, I wonder if anyone's read them. Always the same, always in pristine mint condition, uh, as they were when they were uh, uh, first published. So, the reason I'm mentioning this is in volume two and three, Marx explains the forces that have ended up, that he expected capitalism to cure, but they've ended up dominating capitalism. Uh, in, 19, uh, in World War I, everybody expected socialism and communism to be led by Germany. Uh, Luxembourg, Karl Liebknecht, uh, I remember in English class, I had to go to a high school where Mein Kampf was uh, our textbook, and uh, the professor had to sign over his office, uh, give them all with the Rosenberg Scott. Uh, I thought he meant socialist, but he explained he meant Jews. This was the University of Chicago Lab School. Uh, they refused to uh, let me give a, uh, uh, we had to memorize something, and I memorized uh, Carl Liebknecht's late Mayday speech. Uh, they did not give me a passing book. They said that was not literature. Uh, and it was not suitable for an English course. So I'm just giving an example. Uh, the advantage of going to a right-wing school, I think everybody should go to a, an irrationally authoritarian school because uh, the uh, social science professor, Mr. Edgett, uh, kept calling me uh, a commie. And fortunately, there was a Stalinist in the class. And he kept calling me a fascist. And out of that, I recruited... How much? Any? Uh, the, uh, that became the leadership of the uh, Young People's Socialist League, the Trotskyists. Uh, and one of my classmates recruited Bernie Kornfeld, uh, in, uh, not, I'm sorry, Bernie Sanders, uh, in uh, 1962, uh, right after I would uh, left Chicago. So uh, somehow the, uh, the very attempt to uh, fight against Marxism created a, uh, a very uh, good milieu for people to actually uh, study Marx. Uh, the, I've, always had no problem at all expressing Marxist ideas on Wall Street. Everybody at Chase knew that I was a Marxist. As a matter of fact, all the leading economists in the 1960s in Wall Street were Marxists. Uh, I, if you've heard my lectures before, I remember at one point, I think it was 1966, they had uh, the leading economists of uh, Lazard Frere, uh, another company, myself, we used to meet once uh, a month at uh, Sapporo Moto. And at around 9.30 in the evening, we all began discussing uh, a, a pro, uh, the current financial situation as, uh, how it, in terms of volume three of capital. And we broke out laughing. Imagine if the other people knew that uh, all, all of us were Marxists analyzing capital. And wh why, do they, why did Wall Street hire Marxists? We know what it's about. We know it's about exploitation. If you go to a business school and you think it's all in equilibrium, you don't get the system. So uh, business school graduates have not become good uh, managers uh, of capitalism. Uh, they haven't read Marx, and they really believe that uh, uh, the economy is in equilibrium and that there is a circular flow that's going to continue to expand the economy if you just uh, ha uh, let uh, central planning shift from the government to Wall Street. Uh, so what we're in is a kind of central planning today, but the central planning is the opposite of everything that was expected uh, a century ago. Uh, uh, and, you know, what deterred it? Largely because uh, the revolution in the name of Marx didn't occur in Central Europe or Germany, not even in England. It occurred in Russia. Uh, and it very quickly uh, turned uh, away from a socialist revolution into a uh, nationalist revolution to such an extent that by the fifth common turn in uh, 1927, uh, Stalin urged uh, Mao and uh, urged the Chinese Communist Party uh, to support Shanghai Shek uh, <coughs> against uh, Trotsky. Uh, you can read about it in the Harold Isaacs, The Tragedy of the Chinese Revolution. As we all know, there was a, uh, the Shanghai Massacre. And continually in the 1930s, uh, Stalin removed from the Chinese Communist Party every single person that did not want to work with Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, the, the function of, uh, the role of Stalinism in Russia was to prevent the Socialist Revolution in any other country. Uh, uh, in 1931, the German Communist Party had one million uh, members under arms. Stalin told them not to fight. 
throughout the 1930s. He pushed for a united front. So uh, uh, earlier, uh, the, the first speaker uh, mentioned about uh, the end of Russia, uh, uh, the dissolution of uh, Stalinism into the final stage of kleptocracy, uh, uh, changed uh, the whole uh, spirit of uh, Marxism. I think finally the end of uh, Russia has, uh, and the way that it ended, uh, obviously without a clue as to the neoliberal uh, uh, finance capitalism they were embracing, obviously the end of uh, Russian Stalinism means has paved the way for a resurgence in real Marxism. I'd like to remind people that this panel is the continuing relevance of Marx's capital at 100, after, 150, uh, after 150 years, and so hopefully that will be the focus. Uh, I give you now um, Abhinav Sinha, who has come all the way from India, and we're very lucky to have him, as along with the other guests. Uh, he is the editor of a workers' magazine called Mazdur Beagle, Book of Beagle, as well as a Marxist intellectual journal, which is now out in its first edition. I believe you can still get it out here, uh, called The Anvil. So I'll give you uh, Adhanav Sinha. Comments, uh, I'll begin with a small uh, comment. Uh, as Professor Hudson said, uh, a lot of times in most of these leading financial institutions, the economists are often Marxist. You, you find Marxist economists there working for these financial firms. One of the reasons for that, in my opinion, is that the capitalist class has ended up creating a system that it doesn't understand itself. And that is why Nicolas Sarkozy was caught reading capital just after the outbreak of this, this uh, latest economic crisis in 2007-8. And he was obviously shamefaced because the press caught him reading capital. <laughs> so the reason for that is this. They need to understand what they have created. And they have no analytical tool to understand it. And that's why these financial firms are very much willing to hire Marxist economists. Now, I don't call them Marxist. I rather call, call them uh, Marxologists. So they understand Marxism as an academic, uh, uh, academic tool to understand this. Uh, mishmash that they have created. Anyway, uh, this question has been asked time and again that is capital relevant? And I think uh, when uh, capital con uh, completed 100 years in 1967, the same question was asked. When it completed 50 years, nobody asked that question because that was the year of Bolshevik Revolution. But after that, uh, people have kept asking on Golden Jubilee, on Platinum Jubilee. Mm -hmm of capital that is it relevant. And I guess uh, there is a, just like periodic capitalist crisis, there is a periodicity in the rise of interest in capital. So every crisis, when it hits the capitalist world, there is a rise in interest in capital. So uh, the first was the period between the First World War and Second World War, when many studies on capital, often critiquing capital, from within the left movement also. For example, the study of Rosa Luxemburg, the study of uh, uh, Rudolf Hilferding, and also Lenin and Bukharin. The second period comes in 19, late 1960s, 1970s, when Althusser and uh, his students, uh, after uh, the end of a symposium, uh, collected those essays in a volume, Reading Capital. This was also the period when I guess Lucien Colletti was writing about capital, 1960s, 1970s, I don't exactly remember the time. Again in 1980s, when the crisis hits capitalism, there is emergence of this new interpretation of capital. And in 1990s, when the capitalist, the most politically obscene capitalist triumphalism was at its height, even then there were certain sections in the academia as well as political activists who were studying capital. And then this new crisis, the 2000s crisis, uh, which has evoked, in my opinion, unprecedented interest in capital, as evident from the recent debate about crisis theory, whether Marx had a crisis theory or not. If he had, which uh, dimension of his crisis theory is more important today, disproportionality or underconsumption or overaccumulation of capital or financialization or the tendential decline in the rate of profit. 
uh, often people also say that today's world is very different from the world in which Marx was writing Capital. In my opinion, the world in which Marx was writing Capital was much more different than what he described in Capital. Because in that period, capitalist mode of production covered uh, a very small portion, geographically and demographically, of the world. It was concentrated in the northwestern Europe and in embryonic form in certain Central European countries. So if that is the yardstick, uh, we should say that Marx, uh, Marx's prognostications about the development of <coughs> capitalism have, proved, have been proven correct by history. I mean, we are living in a world, uh, Marx is much more a thinker of 21st century as compared to late 19th century. I mean, there has been a uh, publication of this recent biography of Jonathan Sperber. It's a very good, bi well, very well documented uh, biography. But he says that Marx basically was a 19th century thinker. His involvements <coughs> with different questions, his habits, his writing style, his dealing with the uh, you know question of tendential decline in the rate of profit, which according to Sperber is obsolete because Marx was living in the period in, in which uh, there were no no technology which can increase the rate of surplus value, the counter, one of the major countervailing factors of the declining rate of profit. So there was no such technology which could increase rate of surplus in such proportions. So uh, I can just say uh, that uh, uh, Marxism has often been understood as, an, as a simple aggregation of whatever Marx said or whatever Marx wrote. It's not a simple aggregation of whatever Marx said. It's the distillation of a an approach and method, a methodology, from whatever Marx wrote right since the Communist Manifesto, and often Marx contradicted himself. People say that his prognostications about the ultimate collapse of capitalism, I mean capitalism has overlived the expectations of Marx. I mean Marx in, within his lifetime changed his, you know, chronological, uh, mm, what you say, uh, chronological uh, predictions that capitalism will fall. These predictions changed within the time span of Marx, the uh, lifespan of Marx, many a time. So we should rather uh, concentrate, uh, uh, concentrate on the logical aspect of work of Marx, economic theory of Marx, rather than chronological prediction. And the history of capitalism of last 200 years have proved uh, Marx's pro prognostications correct. As Ernest Mendel said, often the critiques of Marxism, they erect an effigy of uh, a wrong definition of capitalism and they force fit this wrong de definition of capitalism in Marx's mouth and then say that look, Marx has been proven incorrect. For example, Paul Samuelson uh, imputes two wrong theories on Marx. One is absolute impoverishment of working class and the other is a linear concept of crisis and decline of capitalism which Marx never subscribed to. Actually, he refuted these simplistic theories. Anyways, why I believe that capitalism, capital is much more relevant today uh, are four reasons. There are four reasons why capitalism is much more relevant today. One is the reason that capitalism as a truly global mode of production emerged with the coming to an end of the process of decolonization. By the 1970s, 1980s, the capitalism truly emerged as a global mode of production as Marx had said. And in all these newly independent countries which have been often wrongly described as semi-feudal, semi-colonial. In my opinion, the, the, these are peculiar models of post-colonial, not without hyphen, post-colonial relatively backward capitalist country. Because there is no feudal rent in the agricultural sector in these countries. Countries like India, Indonesia, Turkey, Egypt. Uh, these are backward capitalist countries, not semi-feudal, semi-colonial countries. So capitalism truly emerged as a global mode of production only towards uh, the end of 1970s and 1980s when the process of decolonization was completed. The second reason, I think, is the much more sharper uh, polarization between working class and capitalist class. I mean, uh, between 1970s and uh, 2010, the number of workers in the Western world, not Western capitalist countries, increased from 300 million to 500 million. And in the same period, the number of workers uh, in the so-called third world countries increased from, from 1.1 billion to almost 3 billion workers. So it, uh, it is this time 
uh, about which we can see say truly that we are living in a world of workers. I mean, different people have people have used different epithets for that. Mike Davis calls it a planet of slums, and different people call it different things. But this polarization between the bourgeoisie and the working class is much more developed as compared to the period of Marx. The third reason is the uh, unprecedented extent of centralization and concentration of capital much beyond anything Marx had imagined. The fourth reason is the much more developed socialization of labor. Often people have confused uh, the fragmentation of the assembly line uh, with a declining scale of production because factories have, uh, the size of factories have decreased with the uh, information technology, communication and transport revolution, the speed of capital has increased and capital has emerged as a hunter and gatherer of cheap labor and cheap raw material all over the globe. So th we see the emergence of a global assembly line. The scale of accumulation and production has increased in an unprecedented way, not, notwithstanding the decreasing size of the plant. Because for example, in India, the average size of plant is less than 80 workers per plant, per industrial plant. So it is not the declining scale of production, it is the increasing scale of production. It's just that the dominant regime of accumulation has changed in the post war era, and we must understand it. There is a lot of confusion, for example, in India about this phenomenon. I won't go into the object and method of capital because I have limited time uh, and uh, Juliet has, has talked about it, the object of capital and the meth dialectical, materials dialectic, uh, dialectical method that Marx employed. I would uh, directly come uh, to a brief discussion of early critics of capital because I think it's very important to understand what the early critics of capital said because what the latest critics of capital are saying is nothing new. For example, David Leibman is resuscitating the old transformation problem, which was put forward by Gordkiewicz in the early 20th century. It's nothing new. It's based on a simple confusion. And Fred Mosley has put forward a brilliant critique of uh, transformation pro problem. And as uh, I don't agree with everything what Andrew Kleiman and, uh, you know, Guglielmo Carcedi say, but uh, Kleiman has said a very good thing, that Marx, uh, uh, economists have changed Marx in various ways. The point, however, is to understand it, interpret it correctly. So don't wreck, fix it if it's not wrecked. So transformation problem or realization problem, it's not a problem. It, these uh, criti criticisms of capital are, are based on simple misunderstanding that Marx did not convert the value of inputs into prices and he converts the value of uh, output into prices. But the simple answer to this question, that the circuit starts with money. It starts with money capital. It doesn't start with uh, some impersonal form of labor values, labor time. It starts, I mean, the capitalists start by buying means of production at the market price and buying the labor power at the market price, paying wages. So there is no need to convert or transform the values of input into prices. So uh, the one of another critique uh, one of the another one of an, uh, <coughs> other major critic of capital, Bohm Bawer, which can be called the father of the mar marginalist school, anachronistically though, but he, he uh, criticized Marx for borrowing. He what he thought he borrowed the dialectical method from Hegel, which led to unnecessary metaphysical, you know, mysticization of simple issues. Piero Sra Pierre Safa, he says that we can start with prices. There is no need to go to values. There is no need for capital volume one. Marx could have directly written volume three and started with prices. So they confuse the phenomenal reality with the essential reality. They criticize Marx for not explaining price fluctuation. Marx never intended to explain price fluctuation. Marx never intended to explain how of price fluctuations. He always intended to explain why of price fluctuation. How prices of production revolve around the gra a center of gravity, which is the value. And market prices revolve around this center of gravity, pro prices of production. So it ultimately comes down to value. So I'm not going into detail of these uh, you know, uh, criticisms of Marx, early criticisms of Marx. But uh, I would directly come to the recent controversy about crisis theory, uh, which I think start 
truly starts with the publication of Michael Heinrich's book, An Introduction to Three Volumes of Capital, and David Harvey's Com Companion to Capital. The, basically, the two schools which are opposed in this crisis is the so-called monocausal school and the multi-causal school. Monocausal explanation of crisis and multi-causal explanation of crisis. So people like Duminal and Levy, David Harvey, uh, many other uh, left and Marxist political economists because uh, say that there is no single reason for capitalist crisis to occur. Ma David Harvey gives an analogy of a human body that human body can die due to old age, but it can, it can die due to many kinds of sickness also. I mean, it can die due to cancer, it can die to many contingent factors. So, in my opinion, what is he putting forward is a contingency theory of, uh, you know, crisis. I mean, every crisis has different reason. Duminal and Levy believe that it's neoliberalism, <coughs> financialization, over-financialization. But all these uh, theorists who believe in the multi-causal explanation, in my opinion, they miss the basic point that Marx, Marxist method uh, precludes uh, this kind of metaphysical approach, this kind of pragmatic metaphysical approach that every crisis, with every crisis you have to under, understand that crisis on its own terms. Every crisis had, has its own particular reason. And Marxist method rather says that there is a main underlying crisis, uh, pr uh, reason of the crisis, cause of the crisis, and in that, uh, Michael Heinrich says that Marx gave up the theory of tendential decline in the rate of profit towards the end of his life. He was growing skeptic about it. But documentary uh, evidence shows that Marx was, he never gave up this theory of tendential decline in the rate of profit. People say that countervailing factors in the post, neo, in the neoliberal era, they become so powerful that uh, rate of profit doesn't decline. But empirical research has shown that there is a secular decline in the rate of profit, not in 30 years or 40 years, but if you take 200 years of capitalist history, there is a tendency, I mean, it happens like this, but if you look in the longer duty, it's a declining rate of profit. Since 1970s, the, world, uh, the rate of world GDP has not ever crossed 3%. And that's, that too, when we include the growth rates of India and China, the main engines of global growth right now, if you exclude those engines, then it comes down to 1.2, 1 1.3%. There are different calculations because calcul I mean, if you torture statistics uh, enough, then you can uh, make them say anything. But if you study it scientifically, then it can be shown that uh, rate of profit has a tendency to decline. Obviously, Marx uh, theorized it as a tendency uh, because countervailing factors cannot overcome this uh, decline in the rate of profit, but if they turn this law into a tendency. And why? Because rate of surplus value, two of, the, two of the main countervailing factors, one is rate of surplus value. Rate of surplus value can has a physical limit, 24 hours. Actually, Marx give, uh, gives a very good analogy of 24 workers and two workers. I mean, there is a physical limit. You can't make a worker work for 24 hours. And it is the labor time which is the measure of value. So rate of surplus value can be increased and can act as a countervailing factor, but it cannot overcome the decline in the rate of profit. The second reason was given by uh, Piero Srafa, who said that with increasing productivity, the value of means of production decreases. So while the technical composition of capital changes, but the value composition doesn't change. But Marx said, there are many flaws in this argument because it misses the dimension of time. Because if labor productivity increases, the new value of the means of production becomes functional only towards the end of the current turnover. So actually in the current turnover, it is the value of means of production which were determined by the labor productivity in the previous turnover. The second problem with that, which Marx himself replied, that while the individual cost or value of the individual unit of machine decreases, the entire new system of machinery, which replaces the old system of machinery, has more value. So actually this countervailing factor also can only, you know, turn the law into a tendency. It cannot overcome the law. So from the very Marxist methodology and the other things, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg's interpretation of underconsumptionism that uh, extended reproduction is not possible in pure capitalism uh, with, uh, because uh, pure extended reproduction can find new consumers not in the workers because workers consumption is a function of 
advanced capital, invested capital, wages are included in the initial capital. And it cannot be consumed by the capitalist class because capitalist class as a whole cannot grow richer by buying off each other's surplus. So he, as Mandel said, that Rosa Luxemburg confused two levels of abstraction. One is the level of capitalism in its totality, which is the subject matter of volume one. And one is the level of many capital, the competition between many capitals, because capital will never be owned by a single capitalist in the capitalist world. In a competitive system, it is actually possible to, for the capitalist class to grow richer by buying off each other's profit. Now, it happens in a very complex process, in a very, as a tendency, but it can happen. Rosa Luxemburg uh, precluded the uh, possibility of growth of capitalism without non-capitalist periphery or non-capitalist consumers. So, uh, monthly review school uh, builds on that under-consumptionist argument uh, uh, to a great extent. But Anwar Sheikh has shown that under-consumptionism and disproportionality between the departments of production, or the two disproportionalities, disproportionality between department one which produces producer goods and department two which produces consumer goods, and the disproportionality between the uh, infinitely expanding productive capacity of capitalism and the limited consumption potential of society, these two disproportionalities are actually expressions, symptoms of the tendential decline in the rate of profit, the, which is the basic expression of, you know, law of accumulation. It will happen. But these symptoms have been mistaken for basic underlying causes by different, even new theorists like David Harvey and Duminel and Levy and Sam Gindin and Leo Panitz. And in my opinion, this is not the correct Marxist methodology. Marxist method is monist. It looks at the principal contradiction. And the principal contradiction of capitalist mode of production, which leads to the ultimate collapse of capitalism, which should not be con uh, confused with inevitable victory of socialism. Every crisis creates dual potential. And if the revolutionary potential is not realized, we are doomed for a period of barbarism, the glimpses of which we can see in the Middle East, in Syria, in Palestine, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, basically, uh, this, what uh, in German is called Zusammen Bruch theory, the theory of ultimate collapse. There is, it's a logical concept, it's not a chronological concept. So, people have con confused, yeah. People have confused it uh, with uh, uh, being a chronological concept and they asked why capitalism did not collapse as Marx had predicted. It was not a chronological prediction, it was a logical prediction that in the long run, either barbarism or socialism. Wow. So, the last thing that I want to say that, uh, and rest can be discussed in the interactive session. In my opinion, Marx did have a crisis theory, and though it was not complete in the mechanical sense, but in theoretical sense, it was complete. And Marxist crisis theory is mainly based on the tendential decline of rate of profit. And it can be proven, and Anwar Sheikh has proven in his latest book, that underconsumption and disproportionality are actually symptoms of this problem. The problem with the monocausalists is that they do not show a proper, can accept uh, the rare exception of Anwar Sheikh. They do not show the interconnection between these different aspects. Uh, disproportionality, underconsumption, and the tendential decline in the rate of profit. In my opinion, that is uh, uh, the true Marxist theory of crisis. And if we understand that theory, it will be easier to understand because all other theories reach reformist conclusions. If it's over financialization, it can be cured by financial regulation. And that is why those who are talking about over financialization and the crisis of neoliberalism, not capitalist mode of production, are asking for a new new deal in America. And that is the basic problem with these theorists. So if you don't rely on tendential decline of rate of profit, all other explanations, under consumption, it can be increased by increasing wages, increasing domestic demand and social wages. If it's financialization, it can be corrected by financial reg regulation, etc., etc. So uh, this is very important to understand the revolutionary uh, character of this theory, this crisis theory. Otherwise, we will reach some kind of Keynesian or Neo-Keynesian conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Ready to take questions? Uh, I guess we'll just get started and I'll just see if we go first.
Yeah, I just want to throw out, and well, thank you, Michael Hudson, for bringing up the towering giant, Leon Trotsky. He get, he's going to get bigger and bigger once again. Yes. I work in, my question to you is about change. I work in a law firm where I proofread huge hedge fund documents that are incomprehensibly bizarre. The parasitism of the finance capitalist is overwhelming. My question is, how long are they going to be able to resist, for their own benefit, some kind of a Keynesian infrastructure jobs program when clearly the capitalist manufacturing system is in crisis, the whole structure is in crisis. They flirt with the Keynesian jobs program, but they're too cowardly to even carry one out. What we're going to do is take a, a group of questions and then we'll ask people. So they want the short term number right here, so I don't know if you're able to forget. Uh, um, if we're talking about the continuing uh, relevance of, uh, uh, of capital, I think one of the things we have to take into account are the latest appearances of capitalism. Uh, Michael spoke uh, very eloquently this morning on the financialization of capitalism. Another aspect uh, of, uh, of it, and another appearance of capitalism, uh, involves so-called information economy. Uh, as Julia pointed out, uh, the first volume of Capital, of course, starts out with uh, the commodity as a repository of uh, value and surplus value. But with so many uh, uh, products these days, uh, in the form of bits and bytes, uh, how does uh, how does capital how is capital relevant in terms of uh, analyzing the the new information economy? Exactly. My question is about uh, the crisis theory uh, problem, <coughs> and uh, a lot of the rhetoric, the uh, uh, rate of profit uh, stuff, kind of comes across as wanting to find a theory to justify a sort of turn down politics saying that if all these other crisis theories are reformist, then we go for the one that is, is more radical, because it's radical rather than it's correct. And I have no problem with the theory itself, but the rhetoric, the rhetoric surrounding the justification of the theory sounds like you're trying to grab for the most radical theory to justify politics. And I also think the question regarding the other crisis theories is, as being dismissible on the grounds of uh, being corrected by reforms, is that a lot of these Marxist thinkers that are coming forward are saying that the reforms aren't enough because you get to the point of an absolute limit. Like you can't solve right. any problems within capital. So. Okay, we'll, we'll hear from these three questions and then move on. I think two that were directed to you. Uh, the first question is about uh, the self-interest of the finance capital. <laughs> Won't they see the light and save us? Uh, no. The uh, interest of finance capital is very different from that of industrial capital. The financial time frame is very short. The average uh, stock, uh, how do you think the average, long the average stockholder, the average stock transaction uh, lasts? The average stock in America is held for 42 seconds. Uh, they're all electronic. Uh, the finance capital strategy is, because of computerized trading, uh, the finance capital strategy is to take the money and run. What are they doing with the money they make with these hedge funds? They're buying farmland in New Zealand and Australia so that they can uh, uh, sort of live in a kind of uh, medieval garrison city or, or a gated community in uh, uh, the southern hemisphere when the northern hemisphere uh, goes under. Uh, they, they don't think long term because uh, as uh, uh, Milton Friedman said, the financial managers have a fi fiduciary duty to their stockholders to make money as quick as possible. And you can make money quickest and possible, quickest by stealing it or by uh, uh, asset stripping uh, of a firm. So asset stripping is their game. It's not a flaw. That's the program. That's the whole idea of uh, uh, financial management of society. Uh, Marx had not uh, expected, uh, expected that. Now, uh, the previous speaker said that, uh, gee, we've got to, we can fix things by regulation of the financial sector. That won't work. Uh, and it won't work because there's already such a large volume, accumulation of debt, that there's no way the debt can be repaid without bankrupting society. 
without preventing workers from buying uh, what they produce, without uh, 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 blocking corporations from reinvesting uh, their earnings in uh, uh, new capital formation. Uh, the volume uh, 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 finance capitalism has painted itself into a corner. Uh, Marx did not expect this. Marx's discussion of crises reflected what was actually occurring in the 19th century. The advantage of a crisis was to wipe out finance capital, to wipe out the debt in a convulsion of bankruptcy. That's what Marx talked about, but you're not having that. Uh, uh, President Obama didn't let any convulsion of bankruptcy. He said, I'd I'm going to bankrupt the people who voted for me. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bankrupt uh, uh, the African Americans the Hispanics, mm -hmm. and the working class, I'm, right. I'm going to make sure 10 million of them lose their homes <laughs> so that my constituency, the Wall Street banks, will not have to lose a single penny. And one penny of their profit is worth any amount, an infinite amount of uh, capital. That's the perspective of finance capital. Anybody else want to comment on the first two questions? I think the third <coughs> point to be directed to you. Uh, on crisis theory. Yeah, but uh, I would also want, uh, I would also like to comment on this, uh, what Professor Hudson just said. That there is a tendency to pit finance capital against industrial capital. As if finance capital is the evil, and industrial capital is the same. But in my opinion, the overproduction which, is, which occurs in the sphere of production, neoliberalism and financialization is a device to overcome that crisis. So, to see these two uh, things metaphysically in an isolated fashion and put uh, more emphasis on this factor of industrial capital if we invest more in the productive sphere then the crisis can be resolved. I mean it started from that investment in the productive sector over accumulation over production and then resolving this crisis and it's not only in volume 2 and 3 Marx in volume 1 towards the end of volume 1 itself says that the trifurcation of surplus value into profit, rent, and interest, there will be a tendency moving towards the, the latter two uh, things, rent and interest. It's not only in capital volume two and three. He alludes to this fact in volume one itself. So there is also a tendency to pit volume one against volume three, which has been done by John Robinson among the non-Marxist economists in the US. Uh, so. Uh, it is very essential to understand, for example, when crisis hit, hit uh, capitalist world, many reformist economists praised the particular kind of a stimulus package that China introduced. China in, uh, introduced a stimulus package in the agrarian sector also, apart from the industrial and financial sector, to increase the domestic demand. And that is the peculiarity of the particular model of capitalism that we see in China, controlled a very strong control over the labor uh, class and production system. The second thing is about information economy. Some uh, uh, this comrade asked about it, and how do we uh, see the relevance of capital in capital in understanding that? I mean, if we see capital not as volume one, two, and three, but a continuing pr project, an unfinished project, we should include Grundrisse and theories of surplus value in that. And in Grundrisse, he talks about general intellect, and that notion of general intellect can be used to understand the present, you know, what due to a misinterpretation of theory of general intellect, intellect Negri has called immaterial labor. I mean, it's not, I, I, and Kalinikos has given a good criticism of this misreading of Marx, uh, this theory of general intellect. But these things are also products and commodities. And those things do, that do not have use values cannot, can become commodity. For example, land by privatization. So when information is privatized, it assumes a price. And that's how we can understand from a Marxist perspective the age of bits and bytes, products as bits and bytes. We cannot go, it's a very complicated topic and still Marxist political economists are working on this and I'm, I, and I, I myself in, uh, uh, am in the process of understanding that. Whatever, uh, whatever I, was, uh, I have understood as yet is this, that we understand the commodification of information, privatization of information is the key to understand from a Marxist political economy perspective. And finally, it's not about, uh, this young comrade asked, it's not about this search for a radical theory. 
I mean, tendential decline in the rate of profit ostensibly is the least radical thing. You know, the most radical, immediately, apparently radical thing seems opposing neoliberalism or financialization, the oligopoly of banks, the oligopoly of finance capital. If you, if we are in search of some radical rhetoric to resurrect the working class movement, the most favored theories are over financialization and underconsumption. The least favored theory from this perspective is tendential decline because it is the most scientific explanation of, but you have to understand it logically and historically. Logical and historical, these two dimensions in the works of Marx cannot be separated, they are intertwined and you know, totally linked. So it's not uh, the search of a radical rhetoric, it's a search for the most logical and scientific explanation of capitalist crisis that have led, in my opinion, more rational Marxist political economists towards uh, favoring this theory of tendential decline. I just, I just want to add a little bit to what Abhinavi said about the information economy, which I totally agree with. Um, you know, we know that, and Bill has probably heard me say this before, I'm sorry, but I'll just have it. But, um, labor is the expenditure of, of human na nerve, brain, and muscle on matter with a definite aim and purpose. Um, uh, com computer programs and, um, I'm thinking of the words, platforms and all those things that are sent along in bits of electrons are the product of human labor and they are matter. Um, now, as to how money is made on them, going off the private property thing, which is, to me, I, I understand it sort of, a, that's is oversimplistic, as a concept of uh, technological rent. Of, um, a rent is a disproportionate return that you can get by denying someone access to something that they need. If people need to be on uh, this uh, Windows frame, uh, this platform to do their work, then basically you're charging a rent to, to, for, for them to have access, even though the actual labor and means of production that were expended in creating that platform have long ago been paid for, and it doesn't cost a lot to blip or electrons, but you're able to charge a rent because you can deny access to it because people need it for all forms of production. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have questions, or did you want to come? We'll wait next round. Uh, yes, Ben. Benjamin. Um, I just started reading Capital, and that's what long ago, so I have like kind of a, a technical issue that I'm not really understanding. But you want to speak up? We can't hear it. Oh, that's all. Um, in the latter half of Capital Volume One, I think Marx did say that his point was to not have a theory of prices. And he was obviously a proponent of Ricardo and Adam Smith's labor theory of value. But I, uh, I'm from Baruch, so I learned like the mainstream economic theory of value, which is the marginal utility value. So I, I've been wrestling with these two, deciding which one to pick. I know which one you guys are pick. But um, <laughs> so I went to my neoclassical professor, he's from Harvard, and I wanted to ask him like support the supply and demand theory, and he said. In the classic um, neoclassical um, or just classical model, you have infinite, almost like an infinite number of um, consumers, infinite number of sellers. So you have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium prop, um, quantity. And he told me that, well, honestly, the neoclassical professors are kind of stumped because we don't know why there's like this specific point. We know that supply and demand can influence prices, like increase the price, decrease the price. This is something Marx talked about in the latter half of Capital. But he had no idea. He even told me, he even reached out an old textbook that he read where the guy is literally saying, I don't know, it's a judge, someone that just judges what this price does, natural prices. And then it clicked to me that maybe Marx's theory of value was correct because labor is the one that determines the natural price and the natural um, quantity. And just, I guess, the neoclassical rejected it or didn't look at it. And I was wondering if this is correct in my little uh, assumption. Because then I have to factor in, well, what about the price of the overhead of the factory or the new machines? Because people might value well, this might get into use values of a Mustang versus a Camaro, even though they're kind of the same price, one might be technically more valuable than the other, given you know, different technologies, even though the socially necessary labor time to create both those cars are exactly the same. So you can kind of tell why I have this dilemma going on between the marginal utility value and the labor theory of value that Strafa and Ricardo have been supporting for a very long time. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, <laughs> I just need to get that. Okay, and I also, I kind of 
want to piggyback on what he was saying. We're talking about the declining rate of profit, and a lot of that is due to market. And also, sort of what you're saying, markets are not infinite. There's finite, you know, there's such a thing as market saturation, and capitalism tends to overdevelop one sector while underdeveloping <coughs> other sectors. And so, in order to restore itself, I mean, you could do all the Keynesian and all of that you want, but ultimately, it needs to, you know, and you'd also come out consumption. Consumption's not bottomless. And, and after a while, I mean, what are we consuming? There's an environmental cost to that, too, which also creates its own economic dilemmas because as you use up resources, for one thing, you can't use them for another thing. So usually capital, besides a, um, the Keynesian model, I mean, they tend to just blow shit up. You know, if you can't expand anywhere, you, you just bomb stuff and start over again. That was the whole basis of World War II, you know, that's the Marshall Plan. So that's one of the reasons why we go to barbarism. Okay, are there any other questions, comments? Okay, back to the room. Uh, I was just wondering what other books um, Robbie or any of the other um, panelists might recommend on um, understanding uh, or reading contemporary commentary on uh, falling rate profit. Um, I, I'm sort of a fan of Murray Smith's book, Invisible Leviathan, and uh, Shane Mage's thesis. But I, I think that um, maybe I'm seeing it from the opposite end of uh, one of the other questioners. Like, I, I don't think that it uh, is a search for the most radical interpretation of capital, but rather that, that understanding that concept of capital um, poses the question that things are not insoluble with the most radical or revolutionary solution that there isn't a way for um, capitalism to be reformed. The system can't be fixed because this is exactly what the system is. And I think of the uh, FDR quote that was mentioned in uh, the previous um, uh, forum that, you know, that he saved capitalism, and that was his great issue. So. Well, you know, I'm a, I study history, so I'm not going to weigh into the tendential rate of profit to decline and so forth. But, um, you know, I do think the, the, the question about information technology, uh, if we're speaking about the modern relevance of capital. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an organizer. We have a um, office called the Justice Center in El Barrio up in East Harlem. And we it's mostly an immigrant community, a working class community. And it's incredible the amount of, you know, people's income which is being spent on re essentially renting things that are already produced. And, you know, obviously the, there, was, there was mentioned the, just what housing is in New York City um, and uh, how that puts a strain on every aspect of, of people's lives. But then when you just look through your bank statement at the end of the month and you go through your Netflix account, you're getting charged for every iTunes song, for every app, and, you know, all these, even the, um, your, your phone bill, which, you know, you're really being charged for uh, rent because all the, the telecommunication wires have long been laid. Um, Verizon and these other companies control usually just the last little piece of the, the, the circuitry, but it's already there. I mean, of course, there is maintenance, and you have to upgrade apps and things like that, and you have to put new content on the Netflix, and there's always human beings who are doing those things. But uh, essentially, I mean, the, the, the price of those things would be so negligible, and in fact, could be just state subsidized and free. Um, and, and I think that you know when we're talking about how to, to take what can be somewhat inaccessible historical works, at least the first three chapters for a lot of people, which is where most people stop reading, um, uh, capital is you know to I think I'll, maybe we can skip forward to some of these other uh, chapters on on rent, on land, um, and also I think looking at peop bringing out people's own bank statements, so to speak. We, you know they can redact the, the things that they like to redact, but the ways in which capital is really um, uh, uh, you know, uh, historically outlived its usefulness, it becomes clear to so many uh, working class people when you go through uh, the, these aspects of, of where their, their money's really going. So I do think that that, like, um, searching for ways that we can always look for, for sort of modern application is, is very important in terms of um, uh, making people feel that they don't need to read. Um, I mean, they, they should read. Everyone should read all 1,300 pages. But um, obviously, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, prescient modern examples, and I do think also the um, you know the, the just to speak a little bit about the current debate, you know to also to 
uh, as you said when you when you when you brought the number of workers, which is an amazing statistic, 1.3 billion workers to 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 3 billion workers who are being brought into uh, capitalist production. I think that's super important for people when they're understanding these debates because often when they're looking at uh, crisis, when they're looking at the expansion of production, they're always it's, a, it's often a national frame because you're looking at national banking institutions or you're wondering about the applicability of Keynesian solutions. Well, they have only national banks that can do that. Um, where, when in fact, production is so globalized now and the working class is so huge that when you start talking about the immiseration of the working class or the, tenden the tendency of uh, wages to go towards just the absolute necessity for um, reproduction, for instance, that would seem completely disproven if you just looked at a U.S. context, because you can see that many workers for long stretches of, of U.S. history were making above what was necessary to just survive. They were, that's, but when you take, a, when you take the, the sweep of the whole global, uh, uh, where production is going, where low-wage production is especially going, then you see, again, that same uh, tendency asserts itself. So I think that that's uh, actually uh, an essential part of attacking some of these economic debates is always sort of widening the spectrum because, you know, as wherever capital is going, that also has to be sort of the subject of our study. Uh, we, we can't just be looking at, uh, you know, the, 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 the U.S. Treasury and whether they can, uh, you know, lower the lending rates and so forth. I mean, those are all interesting questions about whether they still have the capacity to, to, to stimulate the system. But when you look at the, the international context, um, I think that more and more of uh, the general laws of accumulation, the general laws that, that capital laid out are, are more and more uh, correct. Yeah. Uh, the, the questions on the table, once again, are the declining rate of profit and before that the theory of value. Okay, I, I think the declining rate of profit has been misunderstood, uh, especially among Marxists. Marx, uh, Marx's theory of the declining rate of profit it was not a theory of crisis. Mark, it was very simple. Uh, remember what I talked uh, before about uh, Marx being the uh, accountant who discovered depreciation. Marx said that as uh, production becomes more capital intensive, as the investment in capital, machinery, and plant rises relative to uh, the uh, employment of labor, that more and more of the return to capital will be uh, paid to a return to capital relative to a return of capital. Uh, Baumbauer uh, and the Austrians, everybody at the time agreed that production was becoming more capital uh, intensive. So uh, it, uh, if you look at the American economy, uh, most capital formation in the national income account is real estate construction. The real estate sector is the largest sector in the American economy. It absorbs 80% of bank loans. Do you know the average rate of profit uh, since 1945? Zero. And the reason it's zero is you can depreciate a building again and again. every time you sell a building, you can pretend as if you've just made an out-of-pocket investment in the building at, at uh, a higher and higher appraisal cost. Uh, and the declining rate of profit has been used by the real estate sector to avoid paying taxes. Uh, in that sense, you could say it increases. Uh, the profit rent. So uh, I have a chapter uh, in my book on the bubble and beyond, I have a whole chapter on the falling rate of profit uh, for that. Uh, now obviously if we're talking about companies uh, like uh, Microsoft, uh, what passes for profit today, uh, everything is called earnings in the national income account. But er uh, Marx would say earnings are two things. One, there's profit, but also there's economic rent. Almost all of what passes for earnings is economic rent. And that's the, why it's important to read uh, Marx's Theories of Surplus Value and Volume 2 uh, of Capital, especially to understand that it's uh, basically economic rent. So now we get back to the first question, price and value. Uh, the neoclassical economists say there's no difference, that uh, the price of anything is the value. Marx said this is nonsense. Uh, price is the excess of economic rent, free lunch, over and above the value of a commodity, which is what it costs in the form of human labor. So value plus rent uh, equals price. Now, that's why uh, uh, the uh, earlier speaker mentioned that uh, capitalists don't understand uh, how capitalism works. Milton Friedman's guideline was there's no such thing as a free lunch. 
but the economy is all about a free lunch. That's how that's what people call profit, and most of it's rent. I just wanted to say, where's the person who asked that question? No, I can't see you. Did you see Oh, you're high. Okay. Right. Yeah, um, I, I have only a little bit to add. I'm not a big expert on the technicalities of this, but um, uh, the rent thing you said just confused me a little bit there, but just a couple of things I'll say. Prices revolve around values, which are based on labor. The labor uh, that's valued in a commodity includes uh, the um, uh, prorated costs of the means of production that went into it, which were originally made by labor, right? Yeah. So you you know you can all you can break down all of it that way. Um, and then um, as far as whether somebody wants the Camaro or the other car, that's that's the demand factor, right? It's the value based on the different living labor and the dead labor that went into it, and then there's the factor of demand that's well, going to affect the price. Well, I, wasn't, I was hoping that um, like. Like both those cars are exactly the same price, right? And I'm assuming that it takes the same amount of time to create, like the same yeah. amount of labor to get embedded in both those vehicles. But one clearly has to be superior to the other. So it's like there's different levels in the value, you know, social. Well, why does one have to be superior? Like what? just take like the performance, like zero to sixty numbers, hundred miles per hour. That's a use value time. question. So this is just strictly use value. That, that is this is why I can get confused, because yeah. then you have use value, then you have the exchange value, right. then you have the social thing necessary. The, the value of it is based on the labor that went into it. How well it performs is a factor that I'm going to consider if, when I buy it, and it will affect demand. But it doesn't necessarily have to mean that more labor went into it. Mm -hmm. okay. But it affects what I buy. Uh, what this uh, young student friend asked, I'll just add a little bit uh, to that. I mean, one, while studying Marxist political economy, we must not <coughs> dwell too much on categories and definitions. Marxist political economy studies capitalist mode of production and its motion and dynamism. So if you, you have to understand different levels of abstraction. So one is, for example, individual value. One capitalist uses a particular technology, particular kind of labor power, particular level of skill, and he might get that uh, product produced in less labor. So his individual value, individual value of his co product will be less. So he will make more profit because he will be able to sell cheaper. But once this uh, technological differential is equalized, then what matters is market value. So one level is individual value which <coughs> enables the capitalist to uh, you know, uh, reap what Marx called surplus profit. So one level is this. Another is socially necessary labor time. Technology is differential is not there. There is an average productivity, and on the basis of that productivity, the uh, market value is decided. Then that market value, uh, I slightly disagree with Professor Hudson. It's not value plus plus rent which is price. It is value plus average profit. And Marx differentiates between value plus average rent. It's an old Ricardian thesis that it, if you add, it's the rent, which is added to the value of commodity, and it is then becomes price. So Relative surplus value? No, not relative surplus value is the question of individual. Relative surplus value means if you increase the productivity of uh, labor, rather than increasing the absolute labor time of labor, then you get in the same uh, uh, labor time, you create more use values, not more values. The same value is distributed over larger mass of products. So the individual value of per unit product, it decreases and enables the capitalist to be more competitive in the market. So there is individual value, market value, prices of production. Prices of production, which is the natural, what Adam Smith and Ricardo called natural price. Natural price is Marx's prices of production, which is value plus average rate, average profit. Average profit means which is the averaging of uh, total surplus value due to movement of capital uh, from one branch of industry to different branch of industry because every capitalist would try to invest in the most profitable sector. So there will be a tendency to of averaging the profit. There is no moment when the profit is average actually. It's a tendency. So that average profit, if you add it to value, you get prices of production. That prices of production, again, are influenced by supply and demand. But the gra center of gravity of all this is value. 
because a piece of cloth can never be costlier than a Mercedes Benz because a Mercedes Benz has more quantity of flavor. So this fluctuation of prices or the difference between price and value, it has to be understood if we look at the whole thing while taking into consideration the all levels of abstraction at which Marx functions. In capital volume one, he assumes that the worker is getting, you know, value of labor power. But it is not like that. Sometimes he gets more than, and price is not over and above value always. Price can be below value also. Not only over and above what capitalist is getting. It depends on the level of productivity and his techno technological differential to the average technological level. So it can be below value, it can be above value, it can be anything. But total price will always be equal to total value and total va wages will always be equal to total value of labor power. So you have to understand this thing in totality and how it you know, acts differently when you see things in isolation. For example, if you see just one sector, real estate, you can derive conclusions which might be different from the conclusions that Marx derived from analyzing capitalist mode of production in totality. Because there will always be this kind of differential. So it might happen, it can, it can create an optical illusion that actually rate of profit is not declining at, and it has been used by a certain sector to, you know, increase his profit or secure his profit. It can appear, and Marx uses this word again and again in capital, and we must be, Harvey is right about it, you have to look at the words that Marx is using. For example, appears is not equal to is. Marx always uses the is uh, to differentiate between the phenomenal reality and the essential reality. So, anyway, the, another thing this comrade asked, and uh, I cannot, I am not an expert of Marxist political economy, but one thing I surely believe that one should not read any, you know, uh, companion to capital. <laughs> one should read capital. The risk involved with, re with reading companion to capital is that you totally misunderstand it. The risk involved with reading capital is that you will be confused first time. But confusion is the first stage of knowledge. It always goes like that. So, for example, in David Harvey's book, uh, if I'm incorrect, uh, maybe well, more well-read people will correct me, he has confused skilled and unskilled labor with abstract and concrete labor, which are totally different concepts. Is skill and being skilled or unskilled has nothing to do with abstract or concrete labor. So this is a major mistake which can lead to m very wrong conclusions. Uh, one question raised by many people, including Bombava, Srafa, Schumpeter, that Marx's labor theory falls flat when the question of skilled and unskilled labor are raised. But Marx answered this question right in capital where it sees that a skilled labor participates in the total social labor of society not to, with his own labor only, labor power. He co participates it with partially with labor power of those uh, workers who have contributed in production of skill. So if you multiply the unskilled labor with a coefficient based on the cost of production of skill, Actually, skilled and us, the, this gap proves labor theory of value. It doesn't disprove labor theory of value. So, that's the idea. Oh, we just have a few more minutes. Anyone have any questions? Real brief? No. I'll, I'll, I'll present a, a crudely capitalist response to uh, what, it, it's obviously not my response, or I wouldn't call it crude or capitalist, but your, your problem with the, the problem with the Marxist theory of value, the, the problem with your accusation that capitalists are seeking indecent amounts of rent compared to the value they actually contribute, is that uh, you have to ask, how do you incentivize people? Uh, what is the alternative theory of nature to the one that says that what gets people's juices flowing, what gets their creativity going, is to go for ever greater shares of the rent, maximizing their rent if they have anything scarce at all that they can market. Isn't that what makes people tick? And if so, you know, what recipe is there for a change in the system? Crude. Big question. Uh, <laughs> Not the question. Anyone else?
Okay, Pete. Well, uh, in response to what I just said, I would submit that cooperation is just as much part of human nature as competitiveness. Okay. Well, the idea of uh, the solution is quite simple to rent seeking. You take natural monopolies into the public domain. And since most natural monopolies are basic needs, that's exactly what socialism is supposed to provide freely. It's supposed to take things out of the market. Socialism isn't a theory of the markets. It's a theory of what you take out of the market to provide uh, freely. So that, that's how you deal with the, uh, the, uh, the rent question. You nationalize the land. You uh, take the major public utility, education, and healthcare system would be uh, provided by the public sector. Pensions would be provided, not uh, financialized and made uh, part of the market system that uh, facilitates uh, economic rent. So just real, real briefly before Ben goes, um, we're going to have uh, other events uh, where uh, I mean, I've seen how we'll be at and perhaps others. Uh, if you want to sign up for them, uh, Doug Ferrari has got a sign up sheet. There's a sign up sheet floating around. Uh, well, uh, just a, maybe we should end with a quote from Capital. Or no, uh, but, you know, uh, Marx writes that the real barrier of capitalist production is capital itself. It is that capital and its self-expansion appear as the starting and the closing point, the motive and the purpose of production. And, you know, I think that that uh, can speak to lots of workers who are not uh, incentivized to go to work because of some great desire to have a larger share of the rent, but only to make ends meet, to make uh, to, to put food on the table, to pay their rents and so forth. And there's been such an impoverishment of the culture and of society insofar as uh, the whole pursuit of one's life work is uh, just money. And it's just money for the capitalist class. It's also, and the idea of fulfillment at work is a completely alien concept for uh, the vast majority of workers, you can only be fulfilled by leaving production. Um, and so I think that that also speaks to this question of incentives, that there would be just far more incentives than just trying to survive. In fact, our species would be able to survive uh, much more easily without uh, the constriction of capital.